My name is Shahal. I work at AWS, so we're awesome. Come work with, it, with me. And today I'm going to talk to you about writing code in one language and then consuming it in another language. Um, there are plenty of ways to do that. Last year I was here and talked about using WebAssembly in order to do this. Today I'm going to talk about a very specific way of doing that, and that's calls between languages, between code created in different languages in the same process, in the, in the same thread, with minimal uh, cost in the medium in between, or correct way of calling it, FFI, foreign function interfaces. Now, I assume most of you are programmers, so that means you know what a function is and you know what an interface is. What does foreign mean here? Foreign, simply put, means different language. It's an interface that allows us to call functions in different languages. Now, wh why do we want that? Right? Most of us know how programming works. We create an application. The application is written in one language. The libraries of that application are in one language, and then you can't see it because interfaces are hard between screens, too. Um, <clears throat> and you're upset with anyone who suggests that any other language is also worth coding in. So why would we go with the hassle of coding in two different languages? Well, the first reason is that one language might have a different performance or resource profile than the other language. I think the most common example that most of us are aware of is libraries like NumPy that allows us to use an easy but slowish language like Python and still conduct very complex calculations which were compiled ahead of time in C. So we can get the behavior profile, uh, resource-wise, performance-wise of one language in another language. Secondly, we just might have very complex logic that we want to write only once and consume in many places and know that each and every one of these places behaves exactly the same. We don't want to implement this logic multiple times because then we'll have slightly differing implementations and that might be not fun in very critical code. We want to write that code once, test it once and use it everywhere. And lastly, we might just not want to write code. We have already code which does what we do. We just move to a new language and we don't want the hassle of rewriting everything we have. So we'll wrap it up and call it from our current language. So I hope all of this seems pretty exciting to you. These are very nice things. Are you all excited? Are you all interested? Yay! Well, that's the last positive thing I'm going to say in this talk. It's not that easy. So before I go into the problems and things to look out when we're using FFI, I just want to present the protagonist of this talk. It's this class, Substring, substring Finder. I wrote it once in a coding interview. It's a class that allows us to get a collection of substrings and then repeatedly get strings and return whichever substring they contain. I wrote it once in C++. I don't like coding interviews, so I just want to just say, yeah, I'll solve this interview in JavaScript with my code in C++. And this is my hope. I have code in multiple languages, applications in multiple languages. I just want them to call my existing C++ code. But we know we can't. We can't because compilers are very finicky. They like only compiling their languages, not other languages. But after the, <coughs> the code is compiled, we still have a problem. And that problem is called ABI, Application Binary Interface. What does this mean? So most of us know about APIs, an application programming interface. It's the interface that tells a programmer how he can use a certain logic. It tells us things like what arguments this function takes, what's the return value of this function, what does the fun function actually do? And an ABI is very similar, only it's not for the programmer. It's for our, the actual executing binary. It tells one binary how to call code in another binary object, for example, mostly a library, by telling it, listen, you have inputs, put them in this, in the, in this uh, registered, 
expect my output to be in this and this register. I expect my input to be sized by these and these many bytes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's the instructions that binary interactions on the machine require. Now, the thing to notice about both of these interfaces is that they give us backwards compatibility. That is, no matter how you change your code, as long as the API stays the same, anyone who calls this code does not need to rewrite their code. Their code is still co correct. As long as my ABI doesn't change, then no matter how the behavior of my code uh, changed, it doesn't matter, again, to the caller. Their call will still be correct. Their inputs will be in the right registers. Their outputs will be in the right registers. So ABI is important. So why can't so many language interact with, let's say, the C++ ABI? It's big. It's complex. It changes every three years. You need to know about std variant, for example. You can't expect every language to do that. What can you expect? Define a universal interface. There's a name to that universal interface, single letter name. C is not a programming language. It's the interface that each and every other programming language, slight sting, every other usable programming language, interfaces between each other with. It's small, it's consistent, it behaves the same regardless of platform. So it's a great interface. It's just not very fun to program in. So, okay, let, let's adjust our hope, right? We'll write some kind of C wrapper for a C++ code. We'll expose a C interface, and then everyone can call that code. We'll just tell them, find this C code there. You can use our C++ code. How would that look? Let's have a small example. Uh, oh. And before that, sorry, before the example, what can we do? We can do, well, we can use whatever we use in C. We have primitives in C, integers, floating point booleans, pointers, that is, raw pointers, and functions, free functions, not methods on objects, because again, this is C. And C also has structs, structs, that is, a collection, collections of data on the stack. Only, um, most calling languages today are garbage collected languages which used almost exclusively reference types, so they have no way of collecting data on the stack, only primitives. So we will need to translate our C++ interface to a C interface which uses only primitives, pointers, and functions because we can't pass, we can't reliably, consistently pass structs across languages. So how would that look? We have our class, right? Our C++ class, it exposes two interfacing points, two functions. First of all, the, construct uh, the constructor will wrap our constructor with a C function that returns a raw pointer. Now, notice that I'm saying a C function, but the actual code is C++ code. The important part is that the signature is a C signature. And as long as you add some code which doesn't fit in the slide in order to tell the compiler this should behave like a C signature, it doesn't matter that the body of the function is C++-ish. Pl is C++ -ish, right? So we wrapped our, uh, our constructor with something that takes C arguments, converts them to C++ arguments, and then returns our <coughs> dynamically allocated class <coughs> as a pointer. Why is it dynamically allocated class? Because we cannot use structs, not as inputs, not as outputs. Okay, understood, hopefully. And same thing for our uh, single method on our class. We create a C function which takes the object as a pointer and takes the argument as a pointer, wrapped, uh, <coughs> casts them correctly to their C++ behavior, and then calls the method Great, we have our C wrapper. Now we go, and in this example, we use C sharp. And we declare, we declare for our C sharp code, listen, there is a library. I saved you the long way in which you say there is a library. There is a library. That library contains these functions. 
there is no way of saying raw pointer in C sharp, so you say there's an integer which behaves like a pointer <clears throat> that is returned or is taken by this library, just here, C sharp expect these functions. And then we can write C sharp code which interacts with these functions. It, we like object oriented programming, presumably, so we wrap our object with a C sharp object, which in its constructor calls the C wrapper, which calls our C constructor, and in its method, calls the C function, which wraps our C, our C++ method, and contains internally a pointer to our C++ function. So, okay, we have implementation, C wrapper, bindings, and code that calls our C bindings. We have adjusted expectations. We saw that we need to write some kind of language spe specific wrapping around our code, but that's not too bad, right? We just have thin wrapping. We finished our task with C sharp. We now move on to implement our JavaScript uh, wrapper. But we use an API. We read the documentation and we find out that an API specifically interfaces great with C++. No need for the C wrapper. Great. We do our C++ and uh, API wrapper. We can call our code now from C sharp and JavaScript onwards to Java. J and I, Java Native Interface, uses C wrappers, but it uses C wrappers that also require pointers to the Java environment and to Java classes, and suddenly we have to write separate wrapper for each and every language that we use, right? We started with, let's just write thin wrappers, but suddenly each and every one of our wrappers slightly behaves the same. And this is the first point in which our <coughs> dream isn't that great, right? Yes, we can write our code once, and yes, we can wrap our code in C more or less once, but each and every language has its own way of calling external libraries. Each and, so we need to learn each and every language's way of doing that and write the bindings in each and every language, and sometimes these bindings are similar in some ways, sometimes they're very different. So our knowledge is not always transferable on the FFI side, on the calling, wrapping side. Luckily, you can find bindings generators, you'll find macros, you'll find code which can read C++ or C headers, etc., and generate uh, code in the target language. But again, it's not something you get straight out of the box. Straight out of the box, you work in order to get your bindings. And that's the easy part. Because the hard part is actually managing your objects. See, we have our class. Again, our C++ class. And I want to point out a couple of things about this class. It returns a dynamically allocated string it takes as an argument a dynamically allocated string. It takes as another argument a collection, a dynamically allocated connect collection of dynamically allocated strings. And as we saw in the C wrapper, the class itself is dynamically allocated. And the nice thing about dynamic allocations is somebody has to go and tell, and tell our memory allocator to free that memory. And you might notice something about the C sharp code I wrote. No one releases anything. I didn't write that part. I hurriedly passed over how do we convert a C sharp list of strings into a native array of strings. I did not at all talk about when is that native array disposed. So, yes, we need to manage lifetimes. But managing lifetimes, it sounds hard on the end side, it starts hard also. Because I didn't choose strings uh, for no good reason. There is a very specific reason. Let's look at strings. In a lot of higher level languages, strings are immutable. There's a buffer, there's a length, you cannot change them. You create a new string if you change them. C++, C, not so much. You can mutate your uh, str uh, strings. Obviously, you can't take an immutable string, pass
pass it to C++ and let C++ mutate your presumably immutable string. That would change, that would break its behavior. So the first thing we need to do when we want to do something like that is copy our strings. We create a buffer. We say, here's memory for you, C++, to play in. Don't wreck my precious strings. But uh, it's not actually the same string now, is it? Because some languages encode their strings in UTF-16 because there were one or two years where people thought that UTF-16 is good encoding. Um, trust me, if you did not understand that joke, you are so much happier for it. Um, but you need to take your UTF-16 code uh, string and convert it to UTF-8. And because it's a C string, you need to add a null terminator at the end. So even if your string was purely ASCII and <coughs> encoded the same way, you still need to mutate it. And after you've done all that, in your garbage collected language, you need to do the most dangerous and frightening thing. You need to leak this memory over to sea land where who knows when it will be disposed of. And then you need to make sure that there is correct end of life, that it is dis disposed of. And who's in charge of that? The garbage collector has just leaked the string. It is not, it, it doesn't know when the string's end of life has reached. But our C++ side, right, when we're thinking about things like our object, also does not know when the end of life of our string, <coughs> of our substring finder is reached because that is determined by the garbage collector when it is disposing of the C, uh, of the C sharp wrapper object. So we need to make sure that we know when things are disposed. And usually we solve these things with the smart pointers. Hurrah for unique pointer, for a shared pointer. Usually we don't think about those things. Even in C++, in other languages, garbage collector. But the reason that shared pointers will not help us is because shared pointers are structs. And all of their behavior is C++ behavior. If nobody tells the C++ code to execute their uh, destructor, their destructor will not be executed and they'll be very smart, but also completely ineffective. So we need to trigger everything. We need to tell everyone uh, <coughs> everything when end of life has been reached. And we need to do the same thing with exceptions, right? Because I kind of skipped around that, but C++ can throw exceptions and exceptions are mostly dynamically allocated. And somebody needs to catch those exceptions. Somebody needs to know what does a C++ exception actually mean. And who says that your calling language can do that? So your calling language needs to be able to handle the errors in the lifetime of the objects that it doesn't manage, but also that it uh, should manage. Let's just show how complex this can be with our simple string to string function. We have our Java string. We want to convert it into a char pointer, into our C string. How do we do that? We allocate the C string. We encode the C string. We pass the C string over to C++ land. C++ land decides, does it release the string? Does it re retain or return the string? It wants to return it, let's say. So what does it do? It allocates another buffer, a buffer for the new Java string. It, again, encodes its string to the correct form, and then, only then, can the C++, -sharp, uh, C++ part actually release the buffer that it has created. So many steps in order to pass a string back and forth. So, what have we learned about lifetimes? Well, I, I gave you the bad part. Some frameworks wrap strings easily and let you save the lifetimes. But some frameworks don't. And when the framework doesn't do it, we do it. We write handling lifetimes. Now, it's not entirely bad. We just need to repeatedly implement the logic of smart pointers, of unique pointer, for example, to just say, in C sharp, are you garbage collected? Here's a pointer, destroy it. Are you in Java? Are you garbage collected? Here's a pointer. Destroy it. We just need 
to again and again re-implement unique pointer. So it's work, but it's manageable. You know what's also work? Asynchronous coding, right? All of us have been in Bryce's talk. We know that asynchronous coding is going to be so easy so soon. It's already pretty easy in most languages, right? Uh, you have promises in JavaScript. Just async await your promise. And same in, in C Sharp. Probably should be first because they've done it first. Async await your, uh, await your tasks. Async await your, uh, your, uh, your Python futures. Async await your Rust futures. D do something with your C++ senders, receivers, futures. But there's a problem here with these and many, many other languages. And that problem is our interface. Whatever we do, it's a void pointer. <laughs> there is no easy async await work uh, interface in C. So what, what, what do we do, right? We have our function. It's long, it's slow. We want to do it asynchronously. How can we do that? So on our Java side, we start by creating a Java future, an object that we can return to the calling thread and say, here, you'll get your value at some point in this future. And then we call our function, our C++ function, through the interface with arguments and with a callback here. C++, whenever you're ready, display the, uh, your value on screen and also return your value through this callback. We do some uh, asynchronous magic in C++. We call the callback with a result and then we resolve the future. We continue our Java work. Everyone is happy. Why am I making such a mess of it? It's just passing a callback with everything. Isn't this easy? No, we need to manage the lifetime of the callback. Oh, no. But also, that's the easy part. Just make sure that you don't lose your callback. Because let's start going through our threads and what do they actually do. We have a Java thread. That Java thread wants to call an asynchronous work, an asynchronous uh, <coughs> function. So the Java thread creates a future, and the Java thread calls our C++ code, right? It passes the arguments, it creates a callback, it passes the callback, etc. Then our C++ code uploads its work to some other thread, right? It has a thread pool, it has something like that, it has its own threads, it's going to do its work on its own threads. The Java thread is free to carry on doing whatever work it wants. C++ work has been finished, and the C++ code uh, thread calls the callback, resolves the future, continues working inside Java, executing Java work, and suddenly all the threads in our C++ thread pools have suddenly been abducted over time to do Java work, and it sounds very unfair because they like being C++ threads. Um, why did this happen? This happened because the, the, there's no way from the called C++ code to be aware of the calling Java thread to tell it, hey, listen, come back and take your work and continue your, your work. It, it, it's just a different execution. Uh, <clears throat> what was the work? Execution, uh, what? Execution model, it's also an execution context, which was the Bryce term for it. Um, so we need to make sure that we actually handle our threads. And now um, some of you have been working with callbacks and the word doesn't bring jitters, but and they'll know that this is true regardless of FFI. When you have some library with its own thread pool calling callbacks, it will always need to make sure that somehow they get their threads back safely, safely, easily, and fast. But the thing to remember is that we have tooling, we have monitoring tools, we have IDEs, and these IDEs are built to manage threads in one language usually. So our tooling is very bad at telling us, listen, 
your C++ thread has, uh, your C++ work has become suddenly very slow because there is no thread to execute it. And because our tooling is in Java or whatever language we use in. So be aware, right? When you're doing ASIC work, map all your flows, know where everything is executing and make sure that your logic stays and behaves where it is. You need to, just like you need to manage the lifetimes and you need to know where every object is created, you need to know where your threads are, what do they do, and which kids are they talking to. So the same is true, by the way, with thread, <laughs> thread local memory, right? Some language might decide, okay, I can use my threads, I can write stuff in a thread local memory, and it's a global, right? It's a global, it's a global that it will be very hard to track if it's being changed in a completely different language, again, not read and not handled by your, uh, <coughs> by your tooling. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is, FFI, uh, it's so verbose, you need to write bindings in every language. You need to write them over, over again and handle errors and manage your exceptions. And oh, it's so complex. It's complex with lifetimes and it, it's complex with asynchronous work. And uh, there's also a performance cost, right? All of these flow charts and coding, decoding, allocating stuff, it costs, there is a cost in time and space, and yet it's still pretty great because you can write your code once or not even write, rewrite existing code, and you can get mostly the performance of C++ in whatever slow garbage collected language is cool with the kids today. Um, it's just not easy. It's just not the way we're used to handling things but as long as you're prepared, right? Scar, be, be, be prepared. As long as you're prepared to write some extra code and to think about things that we mostly stop thinking about at the early, uh, late uh, <clears throat> last decade, then generally you'll be having a great new tool in your, uh, <clears throat> in your programming tool belt. Thank you very much. We actually have a couple of moments for uh, questions, if anyone has. Yes. Yes, ABI, ABI can break between C++ and itself. In general, if you see a discussion where people say ABI run, you're not going to be happy. Uh, question? Yes. On the marshalling. Okay. You're right. I mentioned the word marshalling, and I will run all the way back to marshalling. What does marshalling mean? Everything I said this. Here. Marshalling is the process of taking data in one format, usually the format used in one language, and then converted it, converting it to be usable in another language. So taking a, a, a Java string, allocating it, encoding it, adding a null terminator, and then leaking it to C is marshalling a JavaScript to a C, uh, to a, uh, a Java string to a C string. By the way, in all my examples, I use Java because I kept saying Java st string script, Java string string, so yes. This is marshalling, and the same is true with a callback. When you take a function in Java, in C Sharp, whatever, and pass it as a function pointer to C, you need to marshal it, pass it to some kind of arcane mechanism which will give you a C function pointer from whatever your language uses a lambda. Uh, so an object is passed as a, uh, as a pointer. Uh, an object is always passed as a pointer to the, uh, again, depending on your framework, an object will be passed as a pointer because usually marshalling is not handled for any arbitrary object. It's dependent on framework. I'm giving here the general rules of the thread. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, come ask me more questions. There were 
details, I think. If you want to email me or be angry at me at Twitter, you're more than welcome to do that. Thank you very, very much.